Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News, on iTunes, one word, Dwyer Boxing News. Same code to add the Roku channel on the Roku website. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's get uncomfortable. Let me just legally protect myself right here. I'm just giving you my opinion. Um, I'm not a medical doctor, right? Let's talk about things that they don't talk about in polite society, right? It's the kind of things that members of a fighter's entourage or journalists looking for access to fighters really can't mention because the subject is too taboo. You look at a weigh-in and you are interested in how the fighters look. You're interested in whether they made weight comfortably. You're looking at their bodies, you're interested in their physical health, right? Is this guy healthy? What we ignore too often is a more nuanced perhaps more difficult question. Is the guy mentally healthy? Right? One of my heroes, economist Thomas Sowell, talks about how, you know, some people are just better at doing things than other people. Then he adds, you know, each of us, sometimes there's some days where we're better at doing things than other days. Right? I believe life operates in cycles. I believe people have up periods and down periods. Right? It's hard to talk to an athlete and to ask him, hey, are you mentally stable? Right? If someone's talking to a fighter's trainer, it's hard to say to that trainer, hey, your guy, did he look focused this training camp? Or is he a little bit batty of late? Is he making bad decisions, in your opinion, in the rest of his life? Now understand, I have a different constituency, right? These videos are really intended for gamblers. We can't worry about being polite when we're betting money. We actually have to get to the heart of the matter. So, let me give a couple of famous examples. You saw Mike Tyson falling apart years ago. Mentally. Right? You could tell that there was some strain involved with being a superstar former heavyweight champion. Understand, when Mike Tyson fought Evander Holyfield in the rematch, after Mike bit Holyfield's ear, referee Mills Lane let that fight continue. It's the second ear bite after Tyson had already bitten off a part of Holyfield's ear. Right after Tyson had maimed Holofield already and the fight was allowed to continue, it was the second ear bite that got Mike Tyson disqualified. Right? I would encourage everyone to listen to that Tyson post fight press conference. Mike didn't get it. In my opinion, he wasn't mentally stable that night, right? Mike was talking about Holofield headbutting as if that gave him the license to then start trying to eat his opponent, trying to bite off parts of the opponent's body. Understand Tyson would then start talking about wanting to eat an opponent's children and stuff like that down the road and it culminated people forget this 
in a pre-fight appearance with Lennox Lewis years later where, according to Lennox Lewis, Mike Tyson tried to bite his leg. Right? This is different than Muhammad Ali trying to sell a fight, trying to sound controversial and come up with rhymes and trying to, you know, uh, playfully threaten Joe Fraser and stuff like that. No, this was a guy who was mentally falling apart. Someone who's mentally falling apart, that's going to impact the quality of the decisions they make in the ring. Right? I'll give another example. Oliver McCall. You might recall he beats Lennox Lewis the first time. In the second fight, Oliver McCall was not ready to fight. Right? He's in the ring crying. He has what I believe was a nervous breakdown during his fight against Lennox Lewis. That's the deciding factor in the rematch. It's Oliver McCall's mental health. Since mental health has decided fights, I believe we need to look at it in analyzing fights. Right? Understand, it's ignored because you really can't say to a fighter, Mike, are you mentally ready? Sometimes the fighter himself doesn't even know. I suspect Mike Tyson found out a lot about himself during that rematch against Evander Holyfield. Now there are two fights on the horizon. They're high risk, but you know, it's in high risk investments where you make profits. Right? There are two fights coming up. Where I have to question the current mental health of one of the fighters. Right? For me, it's the deciding factor. Right? I believe the two fighters I'm going to name are under a lot of pressure, are making a lot of bad decisions, right? are in against opponents who are going to make the bout stressful for them. Right? I just believe that these guys are going to crack in the ring the first fight and as I said it's high risk I actually took this guy in the rematch and did well but I'm betting against him here I have questions right now I'm not a medical doctor I'm just giving you an opinion I have questions right now about the mental health of Mike Alvarado Right? Understand, Mike has had problems in the past. Right? A lot of people have. Right? Mike has served time in jail in the past. Right? Now, Mike has so much to live for right now. A lucrative boxing career. Right? He's about to fight Brandon Rios in the third fight of really what's been a fascinating great trilogy. Right? Mike Alvarado, quite frankly, is, you know, having a high-profile, world-class boxing career. So you would think that Mike Alvarado wouldn't do anything to put that boxing career at risk. Right? Now, Alvarado trains hard. He physically prepares himself for fights. I would question whether he's mentally preparing himself or is mentally prepared for this fight against Brandon Rios. Understand, the other day, Mike Alvarado, right, who is prohibited from having handguns because in part he's a convicted felon, was in a car that got pulled over. Here's what you need to know. Before they pulled over the car, there was an open warrant for Mike Alvarado open warrant for him. Right? Apparently, the police believe that Mike Alvarado may have been in, you know, put it this way, there was an open warrant for Mike Alvarado already. That's before they pulled over the car. The open warrant had been out on him from last summer. 
when they pulled over the car, they see Alvarado put something in the glove compartment. The police open the glove compartment. Here's a shock. It's a firearm. It's a gun that Mike Alvarado's not supposed to have. Now, some clever attorney, I'm sure, is going to somehow make the argument that Mike Alvarado put a piece of paper in that glove compartment. That the gun in the glove compartment wasn't his gun. No doubt some witness is going to come forward or some participant who's going to claim, hey, that was my gun. Right? You know, not Mike's gun. That was my gun. I put it in the glove compartment. Right? People are going to claim that Mike Alvarado knew nothing about this gun. Right? And that it's just by chance that the police saw Alvarado put something in the glove compartment and that when they opened the glove compartment, there happened to be a firearm in that glove compartment. A firearm that Alvarado's not supposed to have. Right? Mike Alvarado, of course, the same month he's fighting, Brandon Rios is dealing with this problem, which, of course, is in criminal court. Right? Think about it. I would encourage everyone to actually research the nature of Mike Alvarado's prior open warrant, of Mike Alvarado's current arrest, and of how Mike Alvarado was able to bail himself out of jail. Now, I'll just say this. I consider Alvarado, as I've said here online before, to be more talented than Brandon Rios, who I view as a limited fighter. Right? Just understand, I'm not here to be part of anyone's fan club. Right? We're just trying to get an edge on the casino. That's the agenda, and it's a narrow one. Right, let's call it as we see it. Brandon Rios is a limited fighter in my opinion. He's a guy who likes to come forward on his front foot and just try to pressure you all night. But understand, Rios has a chip. Rios is relentless. Right? Rios is going to test you. If you're weak-minded, if you're having problems, think Diego Chavez in a recent fight against Rios. Rios is going to be very annoying, right? He might cause you to crack in the ring. Now, here you have Mike Alvarado coming off of two losses. Understand, the first loss in Alvarado's career was his first fight against Rios. So both men know Rios can beat him, right? Alvarado only has three losses. The other two losses are his last two fights. He was broken by Ruslan Provotnikov, right? In my opinion, if you want to see what a mentally broken fighter looks like at the end of a fight, look at the end of the Ruslan Provotnikov Mike Alvarado fight, right? Provotnikov was on his front foot. Alvarado was trying to dance. He was on his back foot. He got hunted down. Right? Got hunted down. He then fights one Manuel Marquez, right? Marquez wins that fight. Alvarado had his moments in that fight. He put Marquez on the canvas. <coughs> but now he's back against Rios. It's my belief and when you've been in the ring with the guy before and the fight's been grueling, when this fight gets going, there are going to be flashbacks. There's a familiarity, right? It's like seeing your ex-wife after months have passed, talking to her, it's hunky-dory, and then getting in an argument with her. Suddenly, you remember the marriage you had. That marriage you had is suddenly front and center. I believe this is going to be like that for Mike Alvarado, and I don't believe he's mentally prepared here. I think part of him is going to be thinking about the multiple problems he's having in the criminal courts. 
right? The open warrant that existed before this last arrest and the gun in the glove compartment here. Understand, these stories that the defense counsel comes up with, they have limits, right? A friend steps forward, right? And says, hey, no, that was my gun, right? A prosecutor might then say, hey, how come Mike Alvarado's fingerprints were all over this gun? Right? The clever defense attorney can then say, hey, you know what? When Mike opened the glove compartment right before the cops came over to the car, right? Talk about bad timing on Mike's part, by the way. Right? Mike then saw the gun for the first time in his life and touched the gun several times with his hand, right? You can imagine there are going to be creative arguments being made. Just to understand, these arguments shouldn't be happening the month the fight's taking place. I'm rolling with Brandon Rios in the third fight against Mike Alvarado. Let's talk about the next fight. And I believe this guy's clearly falling apart. I've said so in an earlier video. I believe this guy's problems outside of the ring make him a prime candidate to be upset. And that's Jermaine Taylor. How many storm clouds do you need? Right? The guy was devastatingly knocked out by Arthur Abraham. He had bleeding on the brain. Takes time off from the sport. He comes back. I understand that they checked him out at many of the best health facilities in the United States and that he's been given a clean bill of health. Then, of course, with so much positive going on in his life, <clears throat> this guy then takes out a handgun, allegedly, according to authorities, and shoots his cousin. Right? Let me just say, he's lucky his cousin survived. You wouldn't be talking about Jermaine Taylor if the cousin didn't survive the gunshot blast. You understand that, right? Let me point out, too, how ridiculous it is with Taylor shooting a cousin. Now, hey, we all have crazy members of our family, right? We all have some members of our family who, quite frankly, don't have our back, who we believe might take money out of our draw, right? Who might be looking for our ATM card and our ATM code. We all have those people in our family. But understand, when you shoot a cousin... That cousin knows who you are. They can identify you as the shooter. There's no mistaken identity here. Right? I would encourage you to Google the facts of his shooting of his cousin. Now, he then fights Sam Solomon. I know, I know, he won the fight. Right? You've heard me say knockouts cause amnesia. I'll say injuries cause amnesia. Right? Understand, a healthy Sam Solomon easily beats the injured Sam Solomon who existed in that fight after Solomon blows out his knee. Right? That fight's competitive. I thought Solomon had figured out Jermaine Taylor. I thought Solomon was on his way to defending his title. <clears throat> then, of course, Solomon's knee goes out. Let's just say Taylor beats the ghost of Sam Solomon. That wasn't Sam Solomon in the ring, <clears throat> right? You know, if, if I'm fighting Mike Tyson and, oh, guess what? Mike Tyson blows out his knee in the middle of the fight. Okay. If I pick up a decision, good for me, right? The point, though, is I haven't faced prime Mike Tyson, especially if Mike Tyson's beaten my ass early in the fight. Then blows out his knee, and guess what? There are just enough rounds left where I come back and win that fight. Right? So I view Christmas as having come early for Jermaine Taylor. He is the middleweight champion. Now, we're hearing that recently, Jermaine Taylor threw a brick through a car window. At a female acquaintance. 
Think about that. Through a brick, through a car window, at a female acquaintance. If you want to wake up the neighbors <clears throat> right now, just go to the parking lot and throw a brick at a car window. Right? Taylor apparently told the police, according to reports, that he felt threatened and had to defend himself. Is that believable to you? You really feel that the middleweight champion was so threatened by this female acquaintance that he had to go get a brick? Because we know a loose brick's not right there next to him, right? We know he had to go and get the brick to then throw it at her as she sits in the car. Let me just say, I don't think his head's on right. I just don't. I'm looking at this guy and I'm wondering what's going on. Also, think about it too. You have the IBF middleweight title. Lord knows there are lucrative fights in the middleweight division. Miguel Cotos, middleweight champion. He's a cash cow. Right? You got guys like Peter Quillen, unbeaten. Had the belt. Right? Took a step back from the belt for a while. He's there. Credible opponent. Right? Janady Golovkin has a share of the middleweight title. When I'm thinking middleweight title, I'm thinking cable, network, HBO, Showtime. I'm thinking pay-per-view. That's what I'm thinking. Well, Jermaine Taylor is having a fight on ESPN. Think about that. Friday night fights to defend his middleweight title against a tough opponent, a guy who himself used to be the junior middleweight champion, a guy who beat Vernon Forrest, a great fighter, right? A guy who got a draw with Sugar Shane Mosley, who's certainly a boxing Hall of Famer, a guy with far above average defense, and that's Sergio Mora, the Latin snake, right? Now, don't you find something curious with this fight suddenly being put together on short notice? on a less than premium channel. Aren't you a bit concerned here too by the timing? It's like, oh, Taylor is still being criminally investigated, is still involved in the shooting of his cousin case. Now we have a new case. Brick through car window thrown at female acquaintance. And now he's quickly fighting on ESPN. This situation seems unstable to me. Right? Because I'm not convinced that Taylor was doing that well against Sam Solomon in the early rounds before Solomon blew out his knee. Right? And because I feel that Mora, apart from his fights against Brian Vera, right? Sometimes some opponents have the key to your style. Right? It's, it's just the way it is. Oran Barkley beat the great Thomas the Hitman Hearns twice. Brian Vera beat Sergio Mora twice. Vera has the secret sauce. But understand, I saw Vera beat Sergio in Zurich. I saw Vera, in my opinion, beat Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. the first time. Right? Vera's a bit enigmatic. Right? When, Ser when Sergio Mora is not fighting Brian Vera, he's an excellent fighter. I like Sergio Mora here. In part because of Jermaine Taylor's mental health issues in my eyes. Now don't get me wrong, this opinion can change if Mora does things silly like shoot a cousin. Throw a brick through a car window before the fight. Okay, if if, if if Mora shows me that he's having the same kind of emotional health decisions, he's making the same kind of decisions as Jermaine Taylor outside of the ring, okay, maybe my opinion will change. Maybe I'll come back here with a follow-up video. But let's just say I think it's ridiculous to envision Mora 
as having judgment that bad. But yet that's the behavior of Jermaine Taylor these days. So to sum up, right, and as I've said before, this is not a fan club site. I'm a fan of the sport. I guess this is a boxing video, but I'm not here to be a part of any fighter's fan club. Right? Let's just try to beat the casino. I don't want to show up and feel that I have to play a political game and stuff like that. No, let's just show up and try to beat the casino. And the way I'm going to try to do that is by betting against Mike Alvarado and by betting against Jermaine Taylor. Now understand the odds are pretty close in the Alvarado fight. You're getting almost even money taking Brandon Rios. It's not that I'm that hyped up on Brandon Rios, but I believe he's mentally tough. I believe he's the kind of guy who's going to keep coming for 12 rounds, right? Also, keep in mind, too, you know, there are many who believe that fighters fighting in their hometown or their home state are primed for upsets. Some fighters feast on being at home. I get the feeling Floyd Mayweather loves fighting in Las Vegas where he lives. He just loves it, right? He's able to, you know, be in a familiar environment. He can train and then go home. It works for him. But I'm telling you there's another group of fighters who, you know, they're fighting at home. Guess what? Friends, family want tickets. The, the press wants to talk to you all the time, right? When you enter the ring, you understand that the crowd is, you know, uh, there with high expectations it's a lot of pressure for some guys. Not everyone is Terrence Crawford fighting in Nebraska, right? This fight is going to be in Colorado. I think that's going to be added pressure on Mike Alvarado, who has lost his last two fights and who's under criminal investigation, right? So I'm fading Mike Alvarado. I'm taking Brandon Rios in that fight, and I'm fading the favorite. The current champion, the bigger name. I'm fading Jermaine Taylor and I'm taking Sergio Mora. In that fight, I feel Mora is underrated. I think Taylor is making bad decisions outside of the ring that could spill into the ring. Also, let's get real for a second on Taylor. Taylor is a real nice guy. At least he was back in the day, right? These days, uh, I can't reconcile what I'm hearing these days, you know, shooting family members, uh, brick in the window. I can't reconcile that with the Jermaine Taylor from back in the day. But let me say this. I saw a couple of Taylor fights back in the day where I thought he got gifts, right? The Winky Wright fight. The Corey Spinks fight. I thought Corey Spinks clearly beat Taylor, right? I thought Taylor was skating through on reputation and persona. People liked him, right? I can't explain, I can't explain what makes a fighter likable. I really can't. But let's just say there's some guys who have to earn everything they get. I view Floyd Mayweather as having to earn everything he gets. Then there are other guys, Ray Leonard, Jermaine Taylor back in the day, Oscar De La Hoya early in his career. There's some guys who we just like. You see the guy, you say, he's a nice guy, I want to root for him. Canelo, right now. Right? And the close fight, somehow, when they add up the scorecards, the scorecards contradict your own eyes. Right? They'll say, oh yeah, you know, Austin Trout has landed more punches, has thrown more punches in this fight. Uh, we're going to give this to Canelo. Right? I thought back in the day, they looked at Winky Wright, who a lot of his style was defensive. Right? When you're watching the Winky Wright style, uh, fight, you thought, oh, this other guy can't even land on Winky. Right? You had to actually be looking for defense and effectiveness. Right? They looked at Winky Wright. They looked at Jermaine Taylor. I thought it was a beauty contest. They picked Taylor. Okay, fine. Corey Spinks is circling Taylor. Makes Taylor look very bad. Right? 
is the smaller man in the ring. I encourage everyone to revisit that film. My point is simply this. You know, Jermaine Taylor, his record might reflect his likability as much as it reflects anything else. He is soft-spoken, he is well-presented, and stuff like that. No question about it. If you're betting against Taylor, you need to understand the aura that he brings in the ring. He's the kind of guy who judges, for whatever reason, give close rounds to. Just be aware of that, right? With all of that said, I'm still taking Sergio Mora, who doesn't have a lot of power, in the fight. I think if Mora is able to get by Taylor's jab, I think Taylor is going to, you know, fall apart. We'll see if I'm right. In fact, for two more fights that were close, where Taylor is given the benefit of the doubt, I encourage you to go back and look at Taylor against Bernard Hopkins. Now, those fights are close. You could score that however you want, right? But it is a bit astonishing that against the guy who at the time was a legendary middleweight champion, Taylor got the benefit of the doubt in both fights from the judges. Just be aware of that. Just be aware that I'm taking Mora against Jermaine Taylor for Taylor's IBF middleweight title on ESPN's Friday Night Fights. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.